Hello, Mr. Courtney here. In this video, we're continuing with nomenclature and we're going to name compounds with polyatomic ions and also name acids. Here are the, the objectives. To name common polyatomic ions, to name compounds that contain polyatomic ions, name acids, and we're going to name the acids based on the anion. We're also going to name common acids and we're also going to write the formula for a compound given its name. So what is a polyatomic ion? So let's break down the word polyatomic. Poly prefix meaning many. Atomic comes from the word atoms. So if you think of it literally, you think of many atoms that make an ion. And that's what a polyatomic ion is. So there are charged particles composed of several atoms that are joined together. And here you see a list of some common polyatomic ions. You have some po sick positively charged one, which is um, a cation called ammonium. You have some singly charged anions, meaning that their charge is negative one. Doubly charged anions, anions with the charge of negative two, and you're triply charged with the charge of negative three. So these are just some common ones. Now you also see that there are some polyatomic ions that contain oxygen. They have the same element, but they have varying amounts of oxygen. So look at these here: chlorine and oxygen, chlorine and oxygen, chlorine and oxygen. We call these oxy and ions, polyatomic ions that contain an atom of one element and oxygen, but the oxygen are in varying amounts in the different polyatomic ions. When we look at a series with two or more oxy and ions, how do we name them? How are they named? What principle is used to name them? So if we look at these two here, we have SO3 minus two, SO4 minus two. So we notice that they both have sulfur and oxygen. But the first one has three oxygen atoms and the second one has four oxygen atoms. So how do we go about naming those? The one with the smaller number of oxygen atoms will end in the suffix "-ite". So we call this sulfite. The one with the larger number of oxygen atoms ends with the suffix "-ate". So we call this sulfate. So we take the root of the element name and we add the suffix ite or ate. Remember ite we use for the smaller number of oxygen and we use eight for the larger number of oxygen atoms. What if we have a series with more than two oxy anions? We're going to use prefixes in front. So we know prefixes go at the front. We're going to use the prefixes hypo and per. Hypo meaning having the fewest and per meaning the most in terms of oxygen atoms. So we have our ClO2 minus ClO3. We go as we start naming as if there are two in a series of two. So the one with the fewer oxygen atoms we call that chlorite. The one with the most oxygen atoms we call that chlorate. Now if we add one more to the series or two more to the series rather we have one with fewer oxygen atoms than chloride, or one less. Since it has the fewest oxygen atoms in the series, we're gonna put the prefix hypo, hypo sorry, in front of chloride. So that gives us hypochlorite. Now this one has one more oxygen atom than the chlorate. So it has the most oxygen atoms now. So we're gonna use the prefix per in front of chlorate. So we call this per chlorate. So how do we name compounds with polyatomic ions? We're going to follow the rules you, that we use to name the type 1 and type 2 binary compounds. So we have this as an example here. So this is our compound. First, we need to identify and name our cation, identify and name our anions, and put the two together to give us the name of our compound. So you notice that NH4 has multiple atoms joined together with a charge. So that is a polyatomic ion. So you look up, or you by now you should know and memorize what NH4 plus is, that's ammonium. And the next one, C2H3O2 negative one, that's acetate. So you put the two together and you get ammonium acetate as the name of your compound. So let's look at some examples here. And I've colored the polyatomic ions already so that makes it a bit easier for you to identify them so here we have NH4 
and F. So NH4, we know polyatomic ion, that's ammonium, and F from fluorine, but it's an anion, so it has to end with "-ide", so that's fluoride, we get ammonium fluoride. Ca is calcium, it's a metal, so it stays the same. SO4, negative 2, that's sulfate, so we put the two together, calcium sulfate. Now you may be saying, well, there's no charge on it, but if you look up on your polyatomic iron chart, there's only one SO4, and it has a charge of negative 2. Also, in an ionic compound, the total charge is equal to zero. You know that the charge on calcium is positive two. So that means the charge on your sulfate and ion must be negative two, so that they can cancel each other. Here we have Mg, magnesium, and we have nitrate. So that's magnesium nitrate. This is sodium, and this is hydroxide, so we get sodium hydroxide. Now, what do we do for compounds with type 2 cations and polyatomic ions? Now, you have to remember that type 2 cations are the elements that form ions with multiple charges, or cations with multiple charges. So we know iron, for example, can form Fe plus 2 and Fe plus 3. So in this example here, we need to determine if, it's, if the charge here is plus 2 or plus 3. The way we go about doing this is by remembering or utilizing the fact that the overall charge in an ionic compound is zero. So that means when we add our total positive charge from the cation and our total negative charge from our anion, it must be equal to zero. We know nitrate has a charge of negative one. Negative one, and we have three of these polyatomic ions. So three times negative one is negative three. So that means our iron must have a charge of positive three to cancel out that negative three charge. So we know we have iron three, and when we name it, remember we use the Roman numerals after the name of a type two cation to identify the charge and nitrate. So that's iron three nitrate. We get to this next one. This is manganese and we have hydroxide. Hydroxide has a charge of negative one. Since we have two of it, that's the total charge of negative two. So that mean, means manganese would have a charge of positive two. So manganese two and hydroxide. So that's manganese two hydroxide. Okay, so let's transition into acids now. How do we name acids? Well, first of all, we need to know what, what acids are. Now, acids are compounds that contain hydrogen ions attached to an anion. So that means hydrogen ions are always going to be our cation. And in this case, we're talking about inorganic acids, where hydrogen will always be at the front. When we name the acid, we name it based on the anion present. So we identify it as an acid based on the hydrogen being present as the cation. So the hydrogen is at the front in the formula. But when we name it, we name it based on the anion present. Okay, so when we name in the acids now, remember we said we name it based on the anion present. If the anion does not contain oxygen, we follow these steps. We start with the prefix hydro. We add the root of the anion. So in this case, the anion, anion is chloride. We use the root chlor. Then we end with the suffix ic, and then the word acid. We put all these together now, we get hydrochloric acid. Let's look at another example, HCN. So we start with the prefix hydro, so we know hydrogen is our cation. Then we see CN, so that means CN together is our anion but it's not an element, it's a polyatomic ion. So you have to remember that and look up the name of CN, which is cyanide. We drop the IDE and we use cyan as the root. Then add the suffix ic, then the word acid, we get hydrocyanic acid. Now what happens if the anion ends with, oc with contains oxygen, sorry? If the anion contains oxygen, we first have to find the name of the polyatomic ion. If it ends with ite, we replace it 
the it with us and then we add the word acid so in this case we have hno2 the hydrogen is first so we know that hydrogen is our cation and this is an acid so we identify we identify our anion we call it nitrite we drop the ite at ou has followed by the word acid we get nitrous acid notice if it contains oxygen we did not start with the prefix hydro so we only use a prefix hydro for acids that do not contain oxygen so here we get nitrous acid what do we do if the prefix if the anion ends with eight sorry we replace the eight with the suffix ic and then the word acid and again we do not start with the prefix hydro because this acid contains oxygen we identify this anion as nitrate so we drop the eight and we add ic plus the word acid so we get nitric or nitric acid so let's look at naming acids of polyatomic ions that contain sulfur and phosphorus so based on what we just talked about if it ends if the polyatomic ion or the anion ends in eight we replace the eight with ic followed by the word acid if it ends in eight replace the eight with us followed by the word acid so you may be looking at these and say well these are pretty simple there's one difference though the root for the polyatomic ions and sulfur and phosphorus are different so for sulfur containing acids we always use the, the root sulfur and for so we use the root sulfur for acids containing sulfur sulfur and for acids containing phosphate phosphorus sorry we use the root phosphor so keep that in mind and these are the exceptions to the norm but we keep the same naming system in terms of replacing it with ic and it with us the only thing that changes is the root that we use so in summary how do you go about naming acids does the acid contain oxygen no you start with the prefix hydro the anion root followed by the suffix ic does it contain oxygen yes look at the ending of the anion name if it ends with it then you replace the it with us followed by the word acid if it ends with eight replace the eight with ic followed by the word acid all right so let's look at writing formulas from names how do we write the formula of a compound given its name first we need to identify and write the formula of each ion present so for example here we have sodium hydroxide so we need to find the formula for sodium ion and this formula for the hydroxide ion so we know sodium is na plus hydroxide is oh minus now we need to determine the amount of each ion required for a neutral compound in this case here now do we have are these ions going to combine in a one-to-one -one ratio what does that mean are the positive and charge negative charges equal in terms of size or better yet are the charges equal and opposite if we add these charges together will they equal to zero in this case yes so if we add positive one to negative one we get a charge we get a total of zero so that means this is the formula for a compound we only need one sodium and one hydroxide ion to form this compound so the formula is NaOH and so we get our sodium hydroxide let's look at this one dinitrogen pentoxide now we see the use of prefixes here so that tells us this is a covalent compound our type 3 compound contains non-metals only and you can see that in the name nitrogen and oxygen oxygen from our oxide so if we have dinitrogen that tells us we have two nitrogens pentoxide tells us we have five oxygen now you're not done because remember the prefixes are written as subscripts in the formula of the compound so that should be written as n2o5 next one we have cobalt 3 nitrate so we're given the formula of the compound and we're given a bit of information here 
since we have the Roman numeral in the name, that tells us the charge on cobalt. And in this case, the charge on cobalt is plus three. So that's cobalt three. Nitrate, you look it up if you don't remember it as your, one of your polyatomic ions. And a hint, since it ends with eight or eight, and that tells you it's a polyatomic ion. NO3 minus. Now we look at how many positive charges we have and how many negative charges we have. Are these going to combine in a one-to-one -one ratio? And the answer is no. So what we're going to do is use the crisscross method. So we're going to move the positive three or the three to a subscript in the nitrate. We're going to move the one to the subscript on the cobalt. So that tells us we need one cobalt and three nitrates. Now let's look at it mathematically. If the charge on cobalt is positive three, we have one of it, our total positive charge is positive three. If the charge on the nitrate is negative one, and we have three of it, our total charge is negative three. So if I add positive three and negative three together, then we get a charge of zero. So this is our formula. Notice the nitrate goes in parentheses. What does that mean? It tells us that we need more than one of our polyatomic ion. So we use parentheses to indicate that more than one of the polyatomic ion was needed. If you need one polyatomic ion, you do not need to write the subscript of one and you do not necessarily have to put it in parentheses. Okay, we have potassium carbonate. So we follow the same rules. Right, the formula in charge of potassium, the formula in charge of carbon carbonate. Now, are these ions going to combine in a one-to-one -one ratio? No. Are the charges equal and opposite? No. If I add these charges together, will they be equal to zero? No. So these are three ways you can check to see if it's going to combine in a one-to-one -one ratio. We have a charge of negative two and a charge of positive one. So that means we need more positive charges to balance out our negative charges. So we realize that we'll need a total charge of positive two to cancel our negative two charge. We use in the crisscross method, we move the one as a subscript to carbonate. So that means we only need one carbonate. We move the two as a subscript from carbonate as a, from move the two from the charge of carbonate to a subscript on potassium. So that gives us K2CO3. And notice we did not put the carbonate in parentheses because we only needed one of the carbonates. So it's not necessary to put it in parentheses. Now, chromic acid. The first hint here we're given is the word acid. And if it's an acid, then we know that all acids contain hydrogen as our cation. So that's our first clue. Hydrogen is our cation. Then we have to look back at chromic. If the name of the acid ends in ic, what did we use to replace ic? We, re we replaced eight. We replaced eight with ic. So in this case, the anion was called chromate. And that's our anion and our cation. Notice these will not combine in a one-to-one -one ratio. So what we do is that we're going to use the crisscross method or use it mathematically. We have a total charge of negative two and a total charge of positive one. But I want these charges to be equal and opposite. So that means I'm going to need two hydrogens to give me a positive two charge to cancel my negative two charge. Or if we use the crisscross method, when we crisscross, remember we only move, remember we only move the numbers, not the signs. So we move the charge, but not the signs moving with the charge. So we move the numbers only, not the signs. So that gives us H2CRO4. Okay, so that takes us to the end of this lesson for today. We looked at naming polyatomic ions. We've talked about what are oxy anions, um, naming acids, naming compounds that contain polyatomic ions, using the name of a compound to determine its formula. Okay, so until next time, I'm out. Blessings.